Okay, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this is the culmination of a very long and beautiful process, and I can't imagine this book having worked out any better. I just couldn't imagine it. It's just a dream. So at any rate, I want to talk about, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Sanjay asked me to say something about the uh, evolution of behavioral economics, so I'll tell one story, two stories, um, both about Ernst. I saw Ernst at the American Economic Association meetings in New York City one year, around 1990, in passing. We were very busy. And I said, Ernst, what are you working on? And he said, fairness. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. But I actually went, oh my god, he's lost. <laughs> <laughs> what could you possibly say? He wasn't lost. The next, about two years later, I got a paper from him. I was in my office at the University of Massachusetts. I opened up this paper, and I read the first half of it. And it was, it was with si said paper with Simon about gift exchange. And I said, this is the start of a new life for me. It's the start of a new life. Not only is it the start of a new life, I know where it's going to end up. I have not been surprised by an experimental fact, exper a result, since then. If you think for a few hours about the implications of that paper, you can pretty much guess how other experiments are going to come out. There have been no surprises for me. Now, maybe there are surprises, but um, it was like a, a paradigm shift. And uh, it took years for it to develop, and now it's pretty well developed. But it's been incredibly exciting, a lot better than my previous in, um, incarnation as a Marxist, which I followed for many years very avidly and then realized it was wrong. OK, at any rate, let me move on here. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, there's something good about finding out when you're 40 years old that what you've been doing for the last 20 years is wrong. It gives you a new life. You know what I mean? I mean, you can say, I'm going to start over now because that didn't work out. I still got a few years left. So that, that was actually quite useful. And there, and there is a lot to, to learn from Marxism. I don't believe that, but never mind. <laughs> OK. Um, I want to start out by talking a little bit just about my new book, uh, Individuality and Entanglement, The Moral and Material. What I've been working on is the integration of the behavioral sciences, um, the way that the natural sciences are integrated. There's, physicists don't fight with with uh, chemists about you know, the nature of the world. Uh, they agree with each other. And if they disagree about something, they fight it out. And they resolve it. And similarly with, uh, with biology and, and geology, et cetera. But in the social sciences, you've got this crazy situation where different social sciences believe totally different things about the world. And they, don't fight, and they, they never fight about it. They're very polite. You know, well, you do your bullshit, and I'll do my good stuff, you know. But in fact, in science, as Andy tried to point out, tolerance is not a virtue. We don't tolerate other people with different scientific ideas than ours. We fight with them about it. Sometimes um, we're wrong, and sometimes other people are wrong. So I've been working on this now for 15 years. And I, the book that I did, uh, the Bounds of Reason was, what do you have to do for economics to make it compatible with sociology and political science and other social sciences? What has to change in economic theory? What this book tries to do is say, OK, let's find some core ideas for every one of the disciplines. Now, there's one there is no core idea for, which is psychology. I'm not sure psychology has a core idea, but I certainly don't know what it is. But for sociology, economics, biology, anthropology, um, and, and, and political theory, I think there are core theories. And I may be wrong of what they are, but at least I'm trying. And if I'm wrong, let somebody else correct it. Um, economics and biology already have core ideas. Uh, they're wrong, but they're core. Sociology and anthropology and uh, political science have no core ideas. Um, but they should. Uh, at any rate, that's what my book is about. Every chapter is about a different discipline, really, in some sense, more or less fundamentally. So I can't possibly talk about it at all. I'm going to talk about politics mostly today. 
Um, okay. Yes. Um, okay, I already talked about that. There we go. This is better. Okay, so here's, I'm going to start with a rather middle, advanced chapter of my, of my book. Core political theory. The core, political, the core of po political theory, I say, is that society is a game with rules. People are players. And politics is the arena where we affirm and change the rules of the game. Unlike the rules in standard game theory, social rules are continually contested by players. Players will lie to scrap old rules and replace them with new rules to serve their purposes. That's what political uh, dynamics is. Now, usually societies have rules on how the rules are changed. But people don't always play by the rules when they want to change the rules, which makes the dynamics of societies very complex. But these dynamics are always dynamics about the changes in the rules of the game that govern social life. And the reason that's important is that um, we're the only species that actually creates social rules for ourselves and who understands that you play by the social rules. At any rate, in my book, the, this, the individuality comes because, in fact, by contrast with other social species, the rules in human societies do not change through some inexorable macro-social process or, bio -social, or biochemical dynamic. Um, rather, our social life flows from the fact that we construct and play social games. That's the heart of political theory, I say. We, Now, the first thing is, playing games with socially constructed rules requires a moral sense. Because playing by the rules is a moral act. Many social rules are morally binding. You can play games with little kids. You make up the rules, you start playing the game. If you don't play it right, they'll say, that's not right, that's not fair, you can't do that. A two-year-old will, will, will understand that. No animal, you know, doing, doing experiments with animals is very, very exciting and fun, and I have lots of friends who do it. But they can't teach a, the, the rules of the game to an animal. You can't teach a chimpanzee the ultimatum game. You just cannot do it. There's no way to communicate that there is a game with rules, and that these are the rules, and you're going to play it, and then we're going to change the rules a little bit, and you'll play it a different way. So even though animals play games, they play games that are inscribed in their genome, but they don't change the rules of the game, and they don't understand that there are rules of the game that go, that are not just simply expressions of their genetic structure. So that's what's special about humans. We have a moral sense because our whole society is a game that we play through, with rules. And people gain satisfaction by playing by the rules. They're ashamed when they break the rules, and they're offended when others break the rules. So this is the centrality of moral theory in political theory, and what's special about humans. Now, there's a sense in which other animals have moral senses, but only one sense, I think, that some, some animals care about conspecifics. That is, they care about the suffering and the pleasure of others of their species. That's other regarding preferences. But humans have another kind of preference, which is Kantian, really, um, which is abstract, universal preference. We do what the right thing. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because we're trying to help or hurt other people. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, even societies. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> I'll get used to this. Even societies that lack governments reward and punish. That's what we learn from these small-scale society studies, that the morality is quite in our hunter-gatherer past. Um, 
Thomas Hobbes famously said that life was a war of all against all before you had institutions. You know, life, uh, the life of, it was poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, it may have been short, but it wasn't any of the other things, as far as we know. Um, people have been, humans, as long as they've existed, have had, have had probably societies organized by rules into games and with morality. Um, our moral sense was developed long before there were courts, jails, and teachers. Um, despots would love to be able to determine the moral sense of their subjects, but they generally cannot. This is one of the most incredible things about humans. You can't force people to have a particular morality. I mean, the Soviets tried to do that for years, you know, preaching this stuff, preaching that. This is the way the good worker is. And nobody believed it. They didn't believe it ever. It's not like they believed it for a while and then they said, well, maybe that's not right. They actually never, it never caught on. Morality has a dynamic that cannot be controlled by states. New technology, of course, might change this. We could have some new technology where every morning people take a pill and they do the right thing according to the good leader. It sounds funny, but it's not, I don't mean it to be funny. I hope that's not the case, but it's certainly one of the possibilities out there. Um, our minds are socially entangled. What people know and what they believe does not reside in individual minds. Minds are socially networked with cognition distributed across the networks. Now in my book, Yes. In my book, I spend a lot of time defending the rational actor model. And I'll talk about that today. But one serious, there's one serious problem with the rational actor model in all of its forms. And that is the assumption of the subjective prior. Individual has a subjective prior. In the real world, people have cognition that's just set, it's distributed across our network of minds. It's not just me. It's not my ideas. It's our ideas. I believe in them because it's our ideas. Um, now, that makes it very harder to do social theory, but it doesn't make it impossible to do social theory. We've been talking, Ernst talked about some of that just previously. We have to talk about how people network their minds and their, their personas into social aggregates that determine what they believe and how their beliefs change over time. Um, and I want to argue, what I, I argue is that entangled minds produce social behavior that is rational, but it does not conform to the standard axioms of decision theory. There are certain weaknesses in traditional decision theory that make it it make rational social um, cognition impenetrable. It cannot be modeled within the traditional theory. So we need a, a, a new theory of social rationality with the axioms and all of that stuff. And I start to do that in my book. What are the axioms of social rationality? Well, it's very complicated, and I only know a little bit of it, but um, I, want to, I think that's what we should be talking about. So, um, I keep turning it off. Okay, the first thing is that you really have to understand is that human morality has an important non-consequential dimension. What do I mean by that? Individuals generally do the right thing when they do the right thing, not because of the personal or social consequences of their actions, but simply because they believe it is the right thing to do. If I'm trading, with, if I'm a trader and there's another trader, and I'm honest in my dealings with that trader, it's not because I love that trader or I care about that trader. I may not like that person at all. I may find that person disgusting. I'm honest because it's the right thing to do. It's not caring about others. Non-consequential morality is not caring about others. It's not caring about social consequences of your act. 
It's just doing the right thing. And this is something that is just characteristically human. Okay, so I've done that. I do what I do because honesty is good. Now, of course, I'm not always honest. But when I'm not honest, I feel very bad about it. Other people, other people may not feel bad. But I'll tell you this. Maybe it's because I've worked it out for my own life. But when I wake up in the morning, I can say, nobody has anything to reveal about me. I haven't done anything wrong. I am a free person, morally free person. I'm incredibly lucky that I don't have anything hanging over me. I'm not having an affair with some woman. I didn't cheat the bank. Uh, and I'm free. So morality can make you free. And I don't do it because of social consequences, because it's good to be honest. And if people are dishonest, then society can't work. It just feels good. OK, so I vote not because my vote can possibly alter the outcome of an election, but because contributing to the election of good leaders is the right thing to do even if one makes no difference to the outcome. That's what I mean by a non-consequential um, act. It's an act which ha makes no difference for the outcome. None whatever. Your vote doesn't matter at all. It doesn't make a difference. I wouldn't call it that. No. I, I think it's an, a, a fundamental... I'll, I'll I understand warm glow. I don't, I don't vote because it makes me happy to vote. I don't like to vote. I don't even like to, to, to go to the supermarket. I work at home. I'm happy as a pay, you know, pig there, you know, typing around. I have to go vote. God damn it. If I don't vote, I'll feel guilty. And I know I should vote. And everybody should vote. So I'm going to go vote. It, there's no warm glow. It's, it's more than that. I, I, I may be sounding like Immanuel Kant. If so, it's not an accident. There's a lot of truth to Kant's approach to, to, um, to morality. And it's also misunderstood a lot. It can be easily un misunderstood. Um, okay. The non-consequentialist moral sense is akin to Aristotle's notion of virtue and even more closely to Immanuel Kant's notion of the categorical imperative. This is, I'm teaching, what I'm saying now is like social theory zero. It should make, the first thing you learn about society is that it's a game and they have rules and playing by the rules requires moral, a moral sense and most of the moral sense is non-consequential. You don't do it because you care about other people. You don't do it because you care about the social outcome. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And you can live your whole life that way. And, and be a perfectly moral person. Now, let's get to, uh, and the categorical imperative is actually quite powerful. John Romer is writing a whole book on, on, on um, Kantian morality and, and social theory. Now, the non-consequentialist dimension of morality is connected to the entanglement of minds. Our minds with, work with a form of efficacy that is socially rational as opposed to being instrumentally rational. Okay, instrumental, all, if you read the axioms that you all have if you're in economics, you've read the savage axioms. I know them very well. I've put them in three books. The savage axioms that they're outcomes, and you make choices that affect the outcomes, and, you're, you, and then according to the utility of the various outcomes. You try to choose. Make the choices that give your utility function the highest um, utility by choosing, by affecting the outcomes that affect your life. But things like voting are non-consequentialist. You get the same president whether you vote or not. And yet, and by the way, there's, it's not just the zero-one choice. It's not less I vote, I don't vote. I mean, if, my, if I have two sick kids, I might not vote. If I have zero sick kids, I will vote. If it's really raining out, I won't vote, maybe. Or maybe I will. So there, these are trade-off choices right in with everything else about you know, uh, your daily 
uh, uh, choices of, of consumer goods. So this instrumental rationality that we see in the savage axioms is quite a absent from non-consequentialist behavior. So non-consequentialist behavior would be just considered completely irrational. I call this distributed effectivity. Now let me give you an example. Is the belief that one has helped a candidate for a political office to win an election despite the obvious and well understood fact that the candidate would have won even if I had not voted or even if I had voted for another candidate. Right? I say, and someone says, well, did you help Hillary Clinton win? Oh, yeah, I voted. I even gave her money. Now, I'm not going to talk about giving you money. Just, just for you. Uh, yeah, I voted. How did that help her win? She didn't win by one vote. She won by 374,000 votes. So how did you voting help her win? Now, what's the answer to that? The, the answer is that if everyone felt that way, no one would vote. So the categorical imperative says I have to vote because if everybody had the mindset that you just expressed, why vote? Because you can't affect the outcome. Then nobody would vote. And then we could have no democracy. That's the categorical imperative. But then I come back and say, and I have tried this in line at the voting queue, you come back and say, yes, but not everybody else does believe that. Given that everybody else goes and votes, your vote doesn't make any difference, so why vote? And the answer to that is the same thing. If everybody understood that, nobody would vote. And you say, well, what's the difference whether everybody understands it or not? And then you better not get it, keep going too far. You're going to get beat up. You know, because you're just being stupid. But the fact is, here, in this audience, you understand what I'm saying, how your vote doesn't matter. Go to an audience where they haven't studied these savage axioms and they don't know what uh, you know, rational decision theory is. You can't even make the, the argument I just made comprehensible to people. They just don't know what you're talking about. They just don't understand what you're talking about, almost ever. And that's because our minds are entangled. We automatically think in terms of being part of a group that, where everybody is supposed to behave in a certain way. And we approve of behaving in that way. So that we're entangled, morally entangled. Um, and it's very funny because like psychologists who don't use the rational actor model very often will say, well, voters always vote selfishly. What do you mean they vote selfishly? Well, they vote for the group that they're in. You know, the Tea Partiers are these white middle class, and they vote against the welfare system. And the blacks are out there trying to get, you know, their piece of the pie, and et cetera. You say, well, that's selfish? If someone's selfish, they won't vote at all. Because one vote can't make a difference. So as soon as you go to the voting booth, you're not selfish anymore. What are you? Well, that's a good question. You can discuss that using a lot of political theory. You, you identify with certain demographic groups, and you act in ways which promote the, the well-being the, or the ideology of those social groups. Fine. But all of politics is a morality play, according to, according to what I'm saying. It's all a morality play. Everything that people do in the public sphere about voting is is motivated by moral sentiment. Now, in the work that I do, I have identified three dimensions of moral sentiment. Self-regarding, other-regarding, and universal. Now, the reason I'm not going to present this in detail, it's unnecessary, but what I missed for a long time was universal. Most of us, I think, in um, behavioral economics understood other-regarding preferences that is, you care about other people and you want to hurt them or help them. But the idea of a universal preference, I, I mean, I won't go through the ideology of it, how, I, how I came to it, but certainly one of the most important uh, buttresses to my feelings about it was a paper by uh, Yuri Gnizzi on honesty. Beautiful paper in which he shows that people are generally willing to pay to be honest. 
They will, when, when there's nobody listening, nobody can figure out whether you're honest or dishonest. There are no paybacks, no reputational effects. But people will sacrifice money in order not to have, make dishonest utterances to others. So that was very important. Uh, and they don't do that because they like the other people. They don't, care, they don't know who the other people are. You can't say you're, you care about somebody else if you don't know them. How can you possibly do that? Well, at any rate, you can, you, can arrange the, you can arrange the experiment so that you don't like the other person <laughs> because that other person's done something nasty to you. But you still won't lie, or at least you won't, you'll, you'll lie more, but you won't, you'll still be willing to pay to be honest. So here are my dimensions, which I use. Huh. Okay, so... Those are three types of morality. Some universal moral principles can have consequences. For instance, when I help a stranger in need. When I go to the airport and I can't find out where I am and I stop someone and say, how do I get to Concourse C? They tell me. They stop. They incur costs to help me. And they don't care about me. It's just the right thing to do. If someone stops me in the airport, I tell them how to get to Concourse C. In fact, I tell them even if I don't know how to get to Concourse C. <laughs> you don't believe that, but people do that. I used to drive a truck when I was a kid, and we didn't have GPS or even maps. So when I went in Philadelphia, I'd go to Germantown, they'd go to a certain street. And I'd say, how do I get? I'll stop someone. How do I get there? Oh, that's a two blocks of turn left at the church. and blah, blah. No such thing. You know. <laughs> So I made up, even at the age of 19, I made up a street called Jalopy Street. There's no Jalopy Street in Philadelphia. And I went to Germantown, and I'd say, so how do I get to Jalopy Street? Well, on the post office on the right, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because people want to help. They love to help. <laughs> they don't have to know. They don't care whether you're driving you out of the range of where you want to go. They're hurting you, but they're helping the stranger. You know. So... <laughs> What do you mean they didn't do the right but thing? I didn't say that. I said people feel good when they do the right thing. So they, they want to feel bad? No, they feel good. They did. They think it's the right thing to give directions to people. If you if they said to you, if they said to me, you give the wrong direction. Well, they think maybe it is Jalopy Street. <laughs> you know, they're not absolutely sure it's not. They think I was up there once visiting my brother-in-law, and I think it was called Jalopy Street. I mean, you can make up all sorts of yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, no, At any rate, so... Yeah, yeah. So it, it brings the question, what is the right thing? What is the right thing to do? How do we identify? I mean, okay, now, he, I have a slide on this. I'll say it right now. I don't care. <laughs> I want to figure out how people behave. I don't want to find out what the right way to behave is. That's what philosophers do. You know, this is, this is the true morality. You know, you're... you're um, utilitarianism or virtue theory or deontological theory. These are the right principles of virtue, of, 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 of morality. And I said, well, I, human beings use everything in the book. They use them all and they mix and match. And we have to understand how people think of their own morality. Uh, but uh, I don't have to think about that. I don't know what's right or wrong. I don't care. I don't, I don't mean I don't care. I don't care in my persona as a researcher. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, but they're also non-consequentialist moral. I know I'm repeating myself because for a lot of people this might be new. There are non-consequentialist virtues such as courage, truthfulness, and loyalty. That is, one is loyal not because you care about the person you're loyal to, but because loyalty is the right way to be. And, and bravery. You may not even care about who wins the war. Soldiers are brave and they don't even know who they're fighting. The famous Yeats poem. I know I shall meet my fate on high. So about a flyer who's flying a, you know, in some European war, and he's saying, I'm going to get shot down and killed. I don't even know who I'm protecting. But I'm doing it. It's my job. It's, what I, it's, it's my, the culmination of my, my being. So at any rate, these are varieties of moral behavior. Um, and I, I, I use this diagram sometimes. 
Homo economicus is self-regarding and um, a private persona. Other regarding, I call homo socialis, you care about other people, the Mother Teresa's of the world. And universalist is homo virtus. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Now, there's another whole sphere of life, the public sphere, that I talked about, voting uh, and other, and, uh, other um, collective actions to change the rules of the game or affirm the rules of the game. And there is no public persona self-regarding. Because if you're self-regarding, you never will participate in, you're never going to get hurt. Why, why participate in a collective action to overthrow the dictator? You could get hurt. You don't want to get hurt. So you won't do it. Why vote? You could be darning your socks, you know? You could be doing all sorts of, you could be changing the diapers of your baby. Why vote? So there's no such thing. There's nothing in here. I don't know how to work the... Uh, yeah, there's nothing in there. Homo parochialis is the uh, Tea Party person or the working class party person who just votes the interest of his group, my demographic group. I care about my demographic group. And finally, Homo universalis votes for welfare programs for other ethnic groups and gives money to... Um, uh, fight, uh, just, fight for justice and uh, equality around the world and all sorts of other stuff. So that's a typology. But the public persona, um, Roe, is completely moral. So politics is a game of morality. Well, here's, you've got what I, I just talked about. I'm not concerned with people should value, but what they do value. I'm not concerned with utilitarian, deontological, and virtue theories in philosophy to say one's better than the other. I think it's, I mean, this is what philosophers do, and I appreciate what they do. I read them all the time. Yeah, but I also like the ballet and the opera, and that doesn't mean that I bring it into my work. It doesn't have anything to do with my work. It's just a nice thing to do to understand, you know, to read Aristotle's virtues. Oh, the point is, real human beings trade off among personal, other regarding. Oh, God, it's this. Real human beings trade off among personal, other regarding, and universalist moral sentiments. One of the biggest things that economics can bring to moral theory is that moral rules are never absolute. There are always values that can be traded off against other values and each other. So thou shalt not kill. Oh yeah, well, there are cases where you know, almost any of us would kill if we could. Or thou shalt vote. Yeah, you should vote, but you know, if I'm here and I get stuck here uh, you know, by, because there's a, a plane, a cancellation of my plane to the United States, I'm not going to hire a private jet to drive me home so I can vote on Tuesday. I trade off among these virtues. And, I, and even honestly, I'm very honest. I really am. I think it's a pleasure to be honest. But I can certainly imagine being dishonest. You know, the incentives are right. I'll be right up there, you know, stomping on the little old lady and taking her pocketbook. <laughs> Bad example. <laughs> and um, finally, we discover through game theoretic, exper theoretic experiments in laboratory and field that these trade-offs can be modeled in terms of rational choice theory. This is one reason I like Jim Andrioni, Jim Andrioni's work so much. He talks about how you trade off. How, how altruistic will you be in giving to others at various costs of giving, you know, various tax rates or, um, uh, on giving? Uh, we trade off. Now, the next question I deal with in my book, it's pretty important, is some behavioral economists argue that people are not rational. In fact, if you ask your average person who reads, and where I come from, the New York Review of Books or something, and, and you ask them, what do you think of a behavioral economist is, oh, that's someone who believes people are irrational. Is that not true? Yes, that's what people, but that, in fact, is, 
uh, is a very, it's not a really important part of um, behavioral economics. There certainly are systematic violations of the rational actor model. Huh. There are lots of them. The Ellsberg and LA paradoxes are well known. And in my book, when I present the rational actor model, I don't present it as being some universal thing and then try to reinterpret every possible event that humans engage in to fit the theory. I argue in any complex system, no one analytical theory is going to cover everything. Uh, Ellsberg paradox, why does it happen? Well, because people, have, people will pay um, for zero information. Uh, they, they will pay positive amounts to give them zero return. Now, maybe I'm wrong. It's certainly not instrumentally rational. But, um, I understand. You can, you can find, this is, by the way, of all science. You have a model, it's fantastic. It does 30,000 things really well, but it's got a few things it doesn't do so well. So then half of the com community of scientists develop models that show that that works too. But it just doesn't work. There, there, in physics, there are things that physicists just don't understand. And every month you read the physics journals, they have a new solution for it. But they're all stupid. The fact is, the Ellsberg paradox is a real paradox. Sure, we can try to understand it, but not, not using the rational actor model. Similarly, L LA. So we need other models. The problem I have is I haven't found any single other model that I think is, has any generality um, besides the rational actor model. So I just say there are anomalies and we can't apply it. When you want to apply the rational actor model, try it out. If it gives you really bad results, then go do something else. But it's not a critique of the rational actor model that it fails. That's not a critique. OK. By the way, there's a nice analogy which I do use here. Denying the rational choice model is like asserting that people cannot see what is really there because people sometimes fall down the steps, or more systematically, or because laboratory experiments reveal that there are optical illusions. We know that there are optical illusions. They're incredibly powerful. I often present them when I give lectures. You know, lines, one line looks bigger than the next, but in fact, it's the opposite. So two things look like they're shaded differently, but they're actually the same shade. And after you tell people they're the same shade, it still looks like they're, they're different. You don't change your mind because you see that you made a mistake. But do, do psychologists go run around and say, well, you know, humans can't see right. Um, you know, we just can't see because look at all these optical illusions. But that's what the behavioral economists do when they say, oh, humans can't make decisions. They're really poor decision makers. Why? Well, look at Linda the um, bank, bank teller. If you don't know that, it doesn't matter. The point is, if you're really good, you can come up with something where people make stupid mistakes systematically, just like in optical illusions. If you really know vision, you can work new optical illusions that are absolutely uh, persuasive to almost every human being. So my point is that what we're trying to do is use rationality theory or rational choice theory in order to understand how humans behave Understanding also that sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we need other theories. I um, already did that. I mean the model that is given by the, the um, um, savage axioms. Okay, the, the mo main one is transitivity. And then there are certain, pr the, um, what do you call it? Uh, the the uh, no wishful thinking axiom, so that the probabilities you put on events don't depend on whether you're going to gain or lose from them. And uh, that, those are the main two. And, uh, but I think there, actually, there is a third, which is that um, you do Bayesian updating. Okay, and of course, those, th there are failures of those. So I try to explain why, why, according to this, according to what I said, 
all of political behavior, or at least canonical political behavior, that is behavior where the individual is irrelevant. One single person making a different decision is not going to change the outcome. Not, for, for instance, when I've gone through, uh, when I was starting to write the chapter that I did on uh, political participation, I found that if you go look at all elections in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain, back to 1840, no election has ever been won by one person. It's not, I'm sorry, decided by one vote. There's never been a, a pivotal voter. Never. People vote, but if you ask them, do you think if you didn't vote, um, the outcome would be different? They say, of course not. That's silly. So it's perfectly non-consequential. There's never been an example of where there was a pivotal voter in a large election. So we need a social, um, we need a, a social rationality theory based on morality. Now, one of the most important points that I have found in my work is that people don't care about statistical regularities. I told you people are non-consequential. That is, they do what they think is right, not because it has a particular social outcome. This is why, for instance, there's a, a often a very low uh, appreciation of economic efficiency in many countries because people don't economic efficiency isn't a morality principle. So it's hard to explain to people why it's interesting, because people know about morality. People don't care about equality. I had a big, I've had big to-dos with those people, especially in the United States, who say, oh, inequalities, we, that's what we have to, we have to emphasize, inequality and, and creating a more equal society. They say, inequality is a genie coefficient. Nobody cares about that. It's just a word. People care about justice. They care about it. There was a, a big, in the United States, that, a lot of people hated the bankers, not because they were making a lot of money, but because they were making money when other people were losing money and losing their jobs. So one way I say this is, the robber barons of the 19th century in America, they weren't infamous because they were barons. They were infamous because they were robbers. Okay, Everything has to be turned into a morality play. And this explains a lot about the, what's going on in the United States now. Um, people are upset at foreigners taking jobs. Because that, it's easy to understand. I've waited around here. I'm here. It's my country. Some other guy comes in and takes my job. Now, that's, of course, I'm not saying that's true. It's a perception. Um, and it, it's a moral perception. It's one you may not agree with. Again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But that is what it, people do, Occupy Wall Street which targeted the, the uh, bankers, was totally a total failure because they couldn't identify anything unjust that the bankers did. They just made money. What's the matter with that? So at any rate, I'm, I want to stress that, that, um, that uh, that non-consequential morality is at the center of modern societies. In the current election era period in the United States, people don't even care about the social issues. I mean, Donald Trump says he's going to lower taxes. Hillary Clinton says she's going to raise taxes on the rich, and I mean rich, a lot richer than me. No one under $250,000 a year will have their taxes raised. The rich will have their taxes raised. You think this? Has anybody support her because of this? No. She doesn't even advertise it. If you look at her ads, they're all about being, you know, kissing little babies and being nice to kids, and uh, and faulting Donald Trump for uh, being a uh, sexual predator. Policies do not matter, and 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 they, people don't care whether your policies are effective or not. Donald Trump says he's going to build a wall. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. The Mexicans are leaving the United States, not coming back. The, Im the immigrant population is declining, not increasing. And walls won't matter because there's other ways to get in. Tunnels, air, boats. 
You're not going to stop it. No, but nobody cares. The emotional thing of this guy is coming out and saying, we're right, even though we can't win. Um, similar with trade deals, but I won't go into that. So, canonical participants. By a canonical participant, I mean an individual who participates in a collective action of some sort without the possibility of making any change in the outcome. Canonical participants, like voters, and by the way, not just voters, let's apply this to, uh, let's apply this to um, all sorts of collective actions. The collective actions that have made democracy possible in you know, Britain and America and around the world. People have fought and died for these institutions. Why have they fought and died for them? Well, and no one individual ever made a difference. Yeah, maybe you can find Guy Hawks, or I don't know who, I'm not a historian, there's one guy led this or that. But mostly it's just tens of thousands of people out there, none of which makes a difference. It's distributed effectivity. We have entangled minds, we think that we're helping even though we can't make a difference. Figure that one out. Because we have to, because we need a social rationality with the axioms and all that stuff, which, um, which give us which explain this behavior. So my argument is that canonical participants in politics are rational, but they do not conform to the, the von Neumann, Murgers, and Savage axioms. So people are contributing socially even when they're irrational according to traditional rationality theory. Their behavior does in fact determine who's elected, and it may in fact determine whether a corrupt regime is or is not toppled. Um, and then there are all sorts of classic political, political science effects that you can show that only rational behavior could give these results. If you just have a, a, a warm glow theory, I vote, you would never get the electoral size effect. Voter turnout declines with increasing size of the electorate. Okay, That is a very common in political theory. It happens all over the world. And in my model, in the book, I show that how it follows from certain analytical principles. The voting cost effect, very obvious. When the cost of voting increases, fewer people vote. But go fill that in to a rational actor model with non-consequential outcomes. The importance of election effect. When the stakes are high, more people vote. Uh, and I could give a lot more. But I won't do that. Um, including strategic voting. People vote strategically, do Verge's law, which only a, a rationality theory could give you. Now, do Verge's law says basically plurality rules, a plurality rule elections tend to favor a two party system, where a double ballot majority system and proportional representation tend to favor multi party systems. This is because of the way people vote, the way they decide who to vote for. So when people vote, they're not just voting. They're making certain rational calculations about how their vote is going to affect the outcome, even though their vote individually can't affect the outcome in any way, whatever. They have distributed, distributed uh, consciousness over the minds with which they are entangled, is what I'm arguing. Um, Oh, this goes on and on, doesn't it? Okay. Distributed effectivity is the human uh, co cognitive uh, form of saying, I helped a certain outcome come about, even though they made no difference. Now, if, you, know, if you're, you and five other people help someone out of the snowbank with their car, you say, I helped get the, the car out of the snowbank. Well, you did. If you hadn't helped, it might not have gotten out at all. There are only six of you. But if you say, I helped make the French Revolution or I helped make the Women's March on Versailles, well, that's just false as, as far as the individual rationality of, of the savage type goes. But it's true for humans. That's part of our social rationality of how we help. And this is why, I sh again, I'll close on this. Try it sometime. Go talk to an audience and try to explain who don't know economics and try to explain to them that their vote doesn't count. 
Try to explain it. It's almost impossible to explain to anyone that idea unless they have read the, um, unless they have uh, done a rational choice theory. And the reason is simply that they go through the same arguments I did. What do you mean my vote doesn't count? Well, it wouldn't have mattered if you didn't vote. Well, if everybody thought that, then we wouldn't have a democracy. Yeah, but everybody doesn't think that, so why do you vote? Well, again, if everybody even thought that, we wouldn't have democracy. And there we stop the categorical imperative rules. So anyway, let me fin I'm finished on this. Um, this is just one chapter in, uh, in our book, in my book. Uh, you can read other parts of it uh, in Sam and my book, A Cooperative Species, um, which is, uh, came out a few years ago. Thank you.